Well, if, uh, thanks for inviting me here. I really appreciate it. And that's a great talk that Adele had. I agree 100% with every single thing she said. And I'm going to take, on, take that and, and kind of run with it a little bit. And we know that obesity in the United States is increasing in epidemic proportions. And this is true in children as well as in ad as adults. The health care costs that are associated directly with obesity are estimated to exceed $150 billion this year and are rising. With diseases such as type 2 diabetes occurring at younger and younger ages, if something is not done to stem this burgeoning tide of obesity, then the health care system that we know today will fall apart. And as Peter mentioned, I am from West Virginia, and West Virginia has always been a leader in the healthcare field. You may not always know that. It's number one in smokers. <laughs> it's in the top five in heart disease every year. And as you can see with these slides, West Virginia is always one of the leaders in obesity. Now, um, but I'm a pediatrician, and so uh, obesity also affects kids. And in West Virginia, 43% of fifth grade students are overweight or obese. It's not just the United States, though. The other developed countries, we're seeing an uh, increase in obesity as well. <laughs> Even our pets are overweight. <laughs> now, um, one to two year olds, if they're obese, um, if they're healthy one to two year olds, no obese parents, the risk of adult obesity is 8%. Normal weight six year olds, 10% risk of adult obesity. But obese six year olds, 50%. So we need to do something at a young age. Obese 10 to 14 year olds with obese parents, 80% risk that they will be obese in their 20s. How do we define obesity? It's really you know, a little bit of a controversy, you know, how do you define obesity? Is it your weight on the scale? Is it 300 pounds, 200 pounds? Uh, what is the definition of obesity? Um, in the past, we've looked at oftentimes skin calipers to measure obesity. Well, those are often inaccurate, uh, hard to reproduce. Um, we've actually uh, now set it on your, on your body mass index. And your BMI, your body mass index, is a calculated value that takes into consideration your height. Obviously, taller people are going to weigh more. Um, if you're over the 85th percentile on your BMI, you're considered overweight. Greater than the 95th percentile, you're considered obese. Now, as pediatricians, we're taught to look at growth curves. And you've all seen the growth curves as our children are growing and, and to see what percentiles they are. And it's really more important to predict adult obesity if the children are actually crossing upward on the growth curve, crossing upward on the BMI curve. So if they go from the 50th percentile on the BMI curve to the 75th percentile to the 85th percentile, they're at much greater risk of adult obesity than someone is at the 85th percentile and has been that way for two or three years. So we can actually look at that at a younger and younger age and say, hey, we need to do something about it. We can talk to the parents and say, this is something we need to approach and this is something we need to do something about before they actually become obese. Now the problem with the BMI, and this is why I've got a picture of, picture of Arnold here, is BMI does have some drawbacks and it does not take into account muscle mass. So people that are big, big bones, big muscles, bodybuilders, they will have an elevated BMI. Um, in the past, in order to, to weigh, we can't really measure and weigh or measure body fat very, very easily. Um, in the past, we've done some un, you know, underwater weighing, and it's really probably the most accurate way to do, to do body fat. But this is a new device. It's called a bod pod. And of course, the underwater measurements are not very practical and are not available very often. But this is a device you actually can get in. It takes about two or three minutes, and it can actually measure your percent body fat. And this is the best way to, to really determine obesity. The problem with this is it's about a $30,000 piece of equipment, and it's not readily available. But as technology improves, I think we will have ways to measure body fat that are a lot easier over the next few years. What about some of the genetics of obesity? And we certainly know that there are genetic factors that are involved. Um, you know, parents that are overweight have children that are overweight. 
Um, fraternal twins, one third of them will have a weight difference as adult of greater than 13 pounds. But identical twins almost never have any weight difference when they're adults. If both parents are obese, two thirds of their children will be obese. If one parent is obese, then half of their children usually be obese. And if neither parent's obese, then usually less than 10% of the children will be obese. So there's certainly some genetic factors. You know, over the last 20 or 30 years, we've identified some of these genes. And some of these genes uh, help control our appetite center, our set point, uh, and have other factors uh, that are associated with obesity. Well, if, why do we have these genes at all? Well, two to three hundred years ago, or two hundred years ago even, it was a survival advantage to have these genes. The people that stored their calories better, the people that were heavier, were actually at an advantage when difficult times with their health or when uh, food was not plentiful or if they got infections, uh, they were actually healthier. But that's not the case anymore. And with all these comorbid conditions that are associated with obesity, uh, we have increased you know, lipid, lipid profiles. We have increased blood pressure. We have early onset in the development of type 2 or adult type diabetes. We have heart disease that's directly associated with obesity. We have strokes. We have PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, we have increased gallbladder disease. We have slipped capital femoral epiphyses, which is kind of a dislocatable hip in, in adolescence. We have increased arthritis, all associated with obesity. But in pediatrics, probably the most damaging uh, is that I see it, or the psychological impact that obesity has with low self-esteem, increased depression, and increased rates of suicide. And again, all these complications directly associated with obesity are estimated to exceed $150 billion. Now, the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, has noticed this increased rise of uh, type 2 diabetes or juvenile di or adult type diabetes occurring in younger and younger kids. So they actually recommend as pediatricians that we screen for it now at beginning at age 10. Um, when I first started in practice almost 20 years ago, we hardly ever saw anybody with adult type diabetes in kids, but now we're seeing it at younger and younger ages. And they recommend if you're overweight and have two risk factors, uh, evidence of insulin resistance or what's called acanthosis nigricans, which is kind of that dark leathery brown coloration of the neck, certain ethnic backgrounds of black population, uh, Native Americans, uh, some Hispanic populations, if you have evidence of high blood pressure, PCOS, they recommend screening every two years with either a glucose tolerance test, uh, hemoglobin A1C, or a fasting blood sugar. Well, how did we get here? And certainly, when I was a kid, kids didn't spend, there's there only two or three channels on TV. We didn't have computers. We didn't have video games. So we were outside. and. Um, is definitely we've become a couch potato nation. And with TVs, video games, and computers, kids can be entertained all day long and not have to leave. It's estimated that the average child watches about three hours of TV per day and spends six and a half hours per day with various media combined. And that's on school days. That's not counting the weekends. It's estimated that we'll spend seven to ten years watching TV of our lives, watching TV by the time we reach age 70. Now this says, uh, the doctor said he needed more activity, so I hide his TV remote three times a week. And <laughs> as a pediatrician, we're taught to ask about exercise and ask these parents oftentimes about exercise. And it's amazing what they report as exercise. And oftentimes it's, you know, I walk, to I walk to my classes at school. We have to go upstairs to get to my second class. Uh, or they walk home from the bus, which is maybe 50 feet from the door. And they consider this exercise. Um, so we really have to encourage exercise daily. And I'm talking about really getting your heart rate up exercise 30 to 45 minutes a day, which kids just aren't getting enough of. 
The American Academy of Pediatrics um, has a position statement that they recommend limiting screen time to one to two hours a day of, of good quality time. Of course, we ought to recommend sports participation or things that can keep kids active, such as you know basketball, soccer, uh, gymnastics, karate. There are certain sports, though, that you don't get a whole lot of exercise, so you have to not just inquire about sports, but make sure they're, they're actually getting some exercise with them. But this is uh, really the main problem, and as Adele mentioned before, uh, in America we no longer fear God or fear the communists, but we fear fat. And this is the f food pyramids. We've made it, modifications to the pyramid. Now we have the food plate. Um, American Heart Association came out with a statement in 1973. Uh, we mentioned McGovern's statement in 77. The Surgeon General came with a statement in 1988. They all said that we need to eat less fat, cut back our saturated fat, eat more carbohydrates. The thinking, obviously, if fat is bad, then low fat must be good. And Americans uh, followed suit, and they went on a fat-free binge with the food industry making more fat-free foods and food labeling. Americans ate more fat-free foods in the 80s and 90s than the previous four decades combined. And if fat was causing obesity and by eating less fat, obviously, we should lose weight. But that's not what happened, as Adele showed in her slides. What happened during the last 30 years is obesity has skyrocketed. And what I'm here to tell you is fat is not bad for you, but being fat is, and the two are not related. <coughs> this is what I like to, uh, to talk about and what I like to call the fat-free fallacy. And you can see, you know, you've got uh, fat-free Twinkies and cookies and fat-free candy. You got baked Lay's. You got Tootsie Pop. Does anybody know what Tootsie Pop says on the label? A fat-free candy. <laughs> of course it's fat-free. It's nothing but sugar. But that's part of the food marketing. Now, how do we get here? And again, I, I was a victim also of the fat-free fallacy. And as a pediatrician and pediatric endocrinologist, I would be referred many patients that are overweight. And, and in general, I, I, I do both. I'm just a general pediatrician. And, and in general, I hated seeing kids that were overweight. And I hated these referrals because nothing worked. And pediatricians were happy to send these kids away because they've tried different things and they're very frustrated as well. But I knew about the genetic factors in obesity and I knew kids needed to exercise more and I knew at the time that they needed to eat less fat. So I referred them all to a dietitian. And one of our, met, or our uh, pediatric residents at the time had to do a required research project. And he looked at 75 children that I'd seen and counseled on obesity uh, from 1994 to 1999. They're school age children, and I'd recommend low fat diet with exercise. And my goal at the time really wasn't even get them to lose weight. My goal was just if they could just maintain their weight as they grew, and that's what the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations are. They can just maintain their weight. But what he found was that most gain weight at the same rate, and some gained even faster. Well, why so many failures? Well, the first thing is fat's not the problem. And this diet is often difficult to follow. It's hard as a parent, if you've got an eight-year-old who's hungry, to say, you can't eat right now. It's difficult for parents to restrict their calories in kids. Kids stay hungry all the time on a low-fat diet because it's not satisfying. Of course, when I saw these kids when they came in their office, I was sure they just weren't following my recommendations. We saw poor results it's because they weren't doing what I told them. But in reality, that wasn't the case. Many of them may have been. Weight loss is slow or non-existent. Overall, across the country, less than 4% success rate. And that's not going to cut it. Well, 
At the time, I was working with a third-year medical student, student who had been himself following the Atkins diet. And this was back 15 years ago. I didn't know anything about the Atkins diet. It wasn't popular at the time. But what I did find, it, and I did know that what I was doing wasn't working. And so, you know, I know I couldn't do any worse. And I wanted to try to make an impact for, for kids because it is really important. Um, but again, I was a victim of the fat-free fallacy. Um, would this diet work? I was very skeptical. But what I did was I went out and bought the Atkins book and read it. And I bought a book called Protein Power and I read it. And it made sense. And then I went back and I looked at my biochemistry and I looked at my physiology textbooks and they said the same thing. Insulin is what makes you gain weight. Insulin is secreted when we eat carbohydrates. But then the next paragraph would say, in order to lose weight, you need to eat less fat. And that didn't make any sense. So I looked at the research, and there was no studies in kids on um, this type of a diet. There were some studies that had placed on restricted calorie diets that were low in carbohydrate, but they were in diet centers where you had to be seen three or four times a week, and they had it's just not practical with 30 to 40 percent of kids being overweight. So, you know, I wanted to make to see if we could design a program that was easy to follow, that it was successful, easy for the parents to understand, and practical. Otherwise, it wasn't worth it. So, what I did was I kind of modified the Atkins diet and basically uh, made it as easy as I can, easy to explain. I limited the carbs total to 30 grams a day. They could eat as much protein as they wanted, as much fat as they wanted, as much calories as they wanted. All they had to do was take a, take a daily multivitamin. And what did we find? Well, 27 children that we had in this, enrolled in the study lost an average of 14 pounds in two months, 24 pounds in four months. They had improvements in blood pressure. They had no complications. And every single one of them said they felt better, they had more energy. So I wasn't convinced by the Atkins Diet book. Or I wasn't convinced by the I was convinced by these kids and the results that I saw on a daily basis because I never saw anybody lose weight until this. And again, it all goes back to insulin. And again, we can lower our insulin by lowering our carbohydrate intake, and this can lead to fat breakdown and weight loss. Well, what about the fat? And, um, you know, we all know that fat's bad for you and it causes heart disease and uh, is what we've been brainwashed to, to think. And um, th there's just been, in the last 10 years, a ton of studies to really contradict this. And Finney, in a, 19, in a 2008 study, looked at Atkins dieters who consumed three times more saturated fat for 12 weeks, and they end up having less fat in their bloodstream. Hayes also looked at dieters with very high saturated fat diet, averaging one and a half pounds of red meat per day with two to four eggs per day. And they showed great improvement in LDL particle size, particle size, which is probably the most important predictive value for preventing heart disease. Now, I don't want you to really look at the study, all these studies, but these are all shorter term studies. And really, I kind of highlighted in red duration, and it's just kind of short-term studies, and all comparing low-fat versus low-carb diets. And every single one of them showed um, in, in, some improvements in lipid panel, lipid profiles. In 2007, Chris Gardner published a study. Now, Chris Gardner uh, was at Stanford, and he set out to prove that the Atkins diet wasn't safe. And he did one of the first long-term studies on low-carbohydrate diets. And he looked at four different groups. He looked at the Atkins diet. He looked at the Dean Ornish diet, which is, if you don't know well, Dean Ornish is the kind of a heart guru diet. And it's no meat, all fruits, vegetables, nuts, fiber. What everyone sells, says is heart healthy. And he looked at the American Heart Association diet and another diet called the Zone diet, which is kind of in between. Uh, the American Heart Association diet and the Atkins diet. And what he found with, in 12 months follow-up, over 300 patients, that 
people on the Atkins diet lost more weight, they were more compliant, they had better improvements in blood sugar, better improvements in blood pressure, better improvements in all the lipid panels compared to the heart healthy Dean Ornish diet and the American Heart Association diet. Now, anybody that would see all that data would say the Atkins diet is better than all those diets. His conclusion was, was now, maybe it's okay and maybe it's safe, but we need more studies. And Dr. Shai uh, looked at two-year follow-up, over 322 patients, and then published it in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, or no, in the New England Journal of Medicine. And he compared low-fat diets versus low-carb diets versus the Mediterranean diet. And he also found the best improvements with people on low-carb diets. Probably, I think, the most important was a, a meta-analysis done, um, looked at, in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, 21 articles and 347,000 patients, and Adele mentioned there was no evidence, no evidence to support saturated fat is associated with heart disease. Well, is, are the barriers we face, is it education, lack of education, too much education, it's really, it's the wrong education. And what is required, what do we have to do um, to make a successful weight loss program? And these are things that we talked about. So what I, what I did was, is, is really f set out with uh, pediatrics uh, four simple rules that were easy to follow. And the first rule is to keep your total carbohydrates to 30 grams a day or less for weight loss. Occasionally, in the really young kids will go up to 60 to 80 carbs a day. And what I found was less than 30 grams of carbs a day, these kids lose weight very quickly. Less than 60 carbs a day, they still lose weight. Usually between 60 and 80 grams, or 60 and 100 grams a day, you'll maintain weight, and above 120, you're going to gain. Now, most kids in the average diet get about 200 to 250 grams of carbs a day. So this is cutting way back. Uh, I recommend that these kids get a, a book on how to, car, how to count carbs, whether it's an iPhone app or whether it's a, a fast food book that, that, that shows how many carbs. And I tell them every single thing that they eat, they need to know how many carbs are in it, whether it's ketchup or chewing gum or, or whatever. I have them keep an accurate food diary and write down everything so that way they know exactly what they're getting. Again, there's no limitations to the amount of protein, no limitations to the amount of calories or fat and take a daily multivitamin, multivitamin. So that's the first rule. And this is really what my food pyramid should look like. And you can see it's heavy on the bottom with meats and vegetables and very light on the top with the grains. This is what we should be eating, should be eating the red meat, the cheese, the eggs, and of course the vegetables. Berries are okay, but you got to be careful with fruits because, you know, bananas, 30 grams of carbs in one banana. Oranges are loaded with carbs, and not fr all fruit is going to be uh, healthy in regards to weight loss. Second rule is I tell these kids not to drink any carbs. And so no milk, no juice, no sugar-sweetened beverages. Now, milk is something that if they're really restricting their carbs, um, less than 30 grams a day, most people would rather eat their carbs than drink their carbs. Uh, but as we get into their maintenance phase, and as they're, if they're not keeping it that strict, and I usually say one glass of milk a day is fine. Um, but no sugar-sweetened beverages, no sports drinks unless they're zero carbs. Um, water, sugar-free uh, drinks, diet sodas are fine. The third rule is kind of common sense. Eat when you're hungry, but do not eat when you're not hungry. And a lot of people get bored, they get something to eat, or they go to the movies, get popcorn, watch TV, grab chips. This is something we have to change. And I tell the parents what they need to do is provide foods for kids that they can eat and still lose weight. Whether it's snack foods like Slim Jims or beef jerky or deviled eggs or ham and cheese, something that they can grab uh, and eat. And of course, the last rule is exercise every day. And uh, you encourage uh, to do this as a family. Really, uh, it, 
in order to lose weight, it really does take a team approach. Um, everyone must be involved. Um, kids spend a lot of time at other places other than home. Obviously, they spend you know eight hours or more at school, aftercare programs, daycare. Um, and parents are you know they're divorced. They've got you know at the mom's house half the time, dad's house half the time. Um, so both parents really have to be uh, involved with it if it's going to be successful. Uh, grandparents are known oftentimes to sabotage diets because they're going to give in and give the kids anything they want. So you got to be careful with that and make sure we know what, the, what they're getting there. Uh, not as much anymore, but oftentimes still at the younger ages, teachers are often um, handing out candy and things as rewards for good behavior at school. or. Um, so even at friend's house, we've got to know what the kids are eating. I follow these kids up every two months, and I look at the results. I know when, when they were on low-fat diets, I hardly saw anybody lose weight. But I know if you follow a restricted carbohydrate diet, you will lose weight, and you will lose a lot of weight. 12 pounds in two months, 24 pounds, 12 to 14 pounds, 24 pounds in four months. So if they come back in a month or two months, they've only lost three or four pounds, I'm going to praise them and tell them they're good, they're doing a good job because they are losing weight. But I also know they're not being as strict in following the diet. And this is something that I can see if they are strict in following the diet, I know how much weight they should lose. And so I can, you know, address and try to figure out why they're not losing as much. I used to ask the parents about their diet history and what kind of things the children are eating, but I know I realize that the parents are going to tell me what they think I want to know. So the first question I always ask is directed to the kids, and I say, well, what do you eat for breakfast? And if they're telling me they're eating eggs, bacon, sausage, omelets, protein bar, something like that, I know that those kids have probably been pretty compliant the rest of the day. But it's quite often they say cereal, toast, Pop-Tarts, pancakes. If they're not getting protein for breakfast, they're not going to be successful the rest of the day. So this is a, the first question I always ask. Are they eating lunch at school? Well, you know, I had, I was telling Adele earlier today that I had a kind of a heated argument with a guy yesterday. And he was telling me that we we're asking about why their child hadn't lost so much weight. And he says, well, you know, he's eating two meals at school, so I know he's getting two healthy meals a day. I'm not sure about it other times. And it turns out school food is the worst. School food follows the USDA food pyramid or they don't lose or they don't get the funding. So if they're eating any meals at school, they've got no chance to lose weight. And so, um, you know, are they packing their lunch for school? Are they making adjustments to school? Occasionally you'll get a school that if you write on a prescription that they need to restrict their carbs 10 grams, 30 grams per meal, then sometimes they'll follow through with that. Again, I ask them how many carbs they're shooting for a day. Do they really understand that? Are they keeping a food journal? Um, some people, 30 carbs a day is too strict for them. And so I would rather go say, well, let's go up to 50 or 60 a day or even 80 a day instead of them giving up and going back to 200 or 250 a day that they were doing before. So you have to kind of individualize that plan and, and foster, you know, try to... Um, you know, stress the long-term health. Um, there's no question I see much better compliance with the restricted carbohydrate diet compared to a low-fat approach overall. And again, if they're not losing weight, um, I know they're not compliant, but I, instead of, you know, chastising them, I, I really try to reinforce that, you know, we're doing this uh, to become healthy and look and prevent long-term complications. Um, I try to address, you know, are they eating more sugar alcohols that may be getting absorbed? Um, do they really understand the diet or, and how honest they've been? Once we get them down to where we want them to be, really the key is maintaining their weight. We, these people do have a genetic tendency to gain weight. And if they go back, even if they've lost 50 or 60 pounds, and they go back to eating what they're eating before, they're going to gain the weight back. So, you know, that's kind of where the art of medicine comes in, and you have to um, kind of individualize for each, each child. 
but usually you can maintain your weight between 60 and 100 grams a day. Uh, and this is where we kind of add more of the healthy carbs and, and uh, other dairy products back in. I try to use three-day increments. So, you know, 100 grams of carbs a day is 300 grams over three days. And if they want to have one day that they cheat and they eat 200 grams of carbs a day, then the next two days uh, they need to cut back and try to keep it around 300 total for three days. And it's, if you don't write it down, if you don't keep track of it, it can add up very quickly. Very easy to lapse into the old habits, and it's really it's a constant battle that we have to face. When I developed this program, I wanted to make sure that we could do it uh, in the office setting that was practical for a pediatrician, family doctor, internal medicine doctor that could do you know with this. And really, I've got it down to 10 to 15 minutes, and and so most people could probably do it. And I've been doing it for a long time, even you know 15 to 20 minutes. And that includes the time it takes to, to rule out other medical causes of obesity, which are very, very rare, but occasionally you can see uh, um, other medical causes uh, causing obesity, and, in, and the time it takes to educate the family. Again, we talked about the schools, and again, the school lunch pro programs uh, have to follow the USDA food pyramid. Um, many schools now are taking pop machines out, but they're replacing them with 100% fruit juice which is just as bad. In fact, with the pot machines, if they have diet sodas, they're probably better. What about some more challenges? Well, in kids that are picky eaters, um, you know, that's certainly a challenge, but the parents have to know that the kids aren't going to starve to death. And if we provide them these healthy foods, and if we really are committed for getting them to lose weight, that they will. A lot, of kids, a lot of parents don't realize that their child is actually overweight, and they think they're just going to kind of grow out of it as they get older, but most of the time it just doesn't happen. Now, a high-protein diet is a little more expensive, and that's when occasionally I get someone that really just can't afford it, and, and, and that's, that's a little tougher. The bottom line, it's pretty easy to follow. It's easy to understand. It's safe, and it works. Let me show you guys some pictures just, just to prove. And this is a 10-year-old boy, and he was depressed. Um, he was the last one picked when they were picking teams in the, in the gym class. Um, he was really committed to lose weight. He lost 50 pounds in six months. Now, 50 pounds for anybody to lose is pretty unbelievable. But for a 10-year-old boy, as he's growing an inch, to lose 50 pounds, his self-esteem improvements that he had were unbelievable. Um, he came in and literally, he stripped down to his underwear on the scales. Now, we've got scales that are out in the middle of waiting areas. There are all kinds of people. He wanted to show everyone how much weight he'd lost. He had five girls' names written on his hat when he came in. These are things that he did not have. This is an 11-year-old boy, and he was in custody of his mother and just got uh, 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 changed custody to his father. And his father brought him in to me, um, and he lost 45 pounds in a year and grew three inches. This is a 10-year-old girl, and she lost 30 pounds in six months. And this is when she started high school. This is a 16-year-old boy, and he lost 81 pounds. This is a 7-year-old girl, and she lost 14 pounds in two months. I had a 13-year-old boy come to see me a few years ago. Um, really just for evaluation of his weight. He was five foot six and weighed 288 pounds. He was 150 pounds overweight. His blood pressure was elevated. And because of the recommendations, and he had the evidence of acanthosis nigra cans, we did a blood sugar on him. He had no, really, was never diagnosed with diabetes. His random blood sugar was 341. His hemoglobin A1C was 9.8. So he, was, he had type 2 diabetes that didn't know it. And so instead of treating him on, putting him on insulin or putting him on medications, we changed his diet. Two months later, he comes back. He lost 24 pounds. His blood pressure was 100 over 68. He had no blood sugar value over 105, and his A1C had come back to 5.8, and he felt better. 
this was just with dietary changes. This girl was uh, 18 years old and had Down syndrome. Of course, with Down syndrome, they're often very short and they often have weight issues. She, because of her significant obesity, she would stop breathing at night and she'd have sleep apnea. And because of her sleep apnea, that led to difficulty with the right side of her heart in getting blood to the lungs. So she developed heart failure. She was 18 years old with heart failure in the hospital. And we put her on a low carbohydrate diet. Today, she's lost 135 pounds as off all medications. And here's her picture. She was 321 pounds over there in the prom of 2008. She was down to 185. It's life changing. So I actually put together a book and, and um, basically with the, the things that I learned, and we have this available with some recipes that are kind of gummy worms here for kind of kid-friendly recipes and some exercises. And we have it available at nomorefatkids.com. Thank you.